And good evening. Yes, good evening, everybody. I praise the Lord we can be here. I pray that you've had a great week in the Lord. I, uh, I, I'm i just happy to be here again tonight. And you might notice the background tonight. If you see the background here in the, uh, uh, in the studio, remember, we have all kinds of backgrounds that we can put up. And, and I saw this one posted on Facebook a few days ago. And it's the rolling hills in the area where I was born. And I just love it. It just brings back a lot of memories. And uh, until I was 12 years old, I lived and grew in, in an area much like this, not too far from actually where this picture was taken. And and uh, it was just a different culture, a different life. And, but, of course, we all have to go through different things in our lives. And my father ended up getting a job in the city in Walla Walla, and we ended up moving. And I found out what city life was like. And after that, I joined the Navy and look where I'm at today. So God is good all the time. Yes, he is. I was just listening to some of the Gaither's music and um, Linda Rondell or Randell, I think is her name. And uh, just a powerful woman of God. And she was singing the God on the Mountain. And again, one of my favorite songs and Dr. Wood, when he was a, here uh, on this earth now he's up in heaven he uh, used to just love to come up here this was his he said one of his favorite little churches favorite churches not just little but favorite churches i uh, gave him a chance just to be with uh with the lord and uh, he just he called this uh one he named it i believe the first year he was here speaking he named this freedom mountain and even though it's nothing like the mountains that we have in pennsylvania or in washington state in Pennsylvania, they call this the Endless Mountains where we live, and he called this Freedom Mountain. It's kind of stuck. So I pray that you had a good week. Uh, never a dull moment when you're when you're working for the Lord. I'll guarantee that. Don't forget our services are when, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Friday nights at 7, and Sunday mornings at 1045 on Facebook Live. But we would love to see you at 10 o'clock in the morning at our standard uh, regular service, if you want to call it. Uh, we just, it's the worship service and everything combined with the word. It's just powerful. Good evening, Jeff. It's good to see you, brother. Praise the Lord. Uh, it's just, it's good to see people popping on. And, and every once in a while, I can actually see them. Other times, I can't. So I'm not ignoring y'all if you happen to come on. I do feel bad that uh, the last few weeks uh, between um, Sundays and, and our, our weekdays, our internet has not been very good. And it's really caused some audio problems, and I'm sorry. I noticed on Sunday morning when I went to um, upload and, and, and so on the, uh, the service, I noticed that a lot of people had troubles hearing us, and, and it was constantly you know spinning and stuff. I'm sorry about that. There's nothing we can do because where we live, our Internet is, is as fast as they said it can be, but it's probably about 10 to 20 times slower than most of yours. So I just praise the Lord that one day we're going to have even faster internet and they're not going to charge us an arm and a leg in our firstborn. So anyway, it is good to see you all and I hope you enjoy the background. I remember a few weeks ago, one person asked, where are you? I love, I love the place you're at. And uh, it's, again, it's software. We're blessed that somebody introduced us, actually my daughter-in-law introduced us to uh, something called Manicam. And it's a software program that uses your internet camera. And you can just put about anything you want in the background. It just takes some training. So anyway, it is, again, great to see all of you. And I, I am on part three of my uh, message. It's kind of interesting because uh, part one and two, really, I God just took me a couple different directions. So I really didn't get past part one even though I did part two this last Sunday. So I, I pray that this this will find you uh, uh, relaxed, give you a moment just to, you, you know, the, the ultimate desire is for us to glorify God. And unfortunately, when you're just, just born again or you're young in the Lord, your desires might not match up with God's desires. And that's what I've been talking about the last few weeks. So for the next 
you know, next few services, I'm going to be talking about this, and I hope it really helps. So last Sunday, I was sharing what I believe uh, an answer to, will you ever see the desires of your heart? And to me, that is a big, big question. And uh, I'm going to go over a few things that I've talked about in part one and two, but as a whole, I just want to con- I want to get on to part uh, part three. But I, I heard this quote this morning uh, by Leonard Ravenhill, again a powerful man of God that has gone to be with the Lord. He's and this was this was really interesting. He said, "You see today, and I believe he I want to say he probably died back in the 50s or the 60s, but he said, "You see today, we try to organize, we try to get a bunch of people together." God never did that. God takes individual men. He takes Moses to the backside of the desert. John the Baptist, Baptist was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Jesus, the Son of God, was uh, who had left the, glo- left the glory, spent 30 years in training to minister. And again, John the Baptist, 30 years in training. Uh, the Apostle Paul, probably 30 years. Moses, at least 40 years, if not more. And we want a lot of people, and I've seen this, we want to go to Bible school six months, a couple years, and come out like we're super prophets and super teachers and preachers. Well, I like what he said here. He said, it's, it's time. It's the time factor that kills most of us. And I, when he said that, I thought, man, that really makes sense. Because I remember when I first went to Bible college, I said, I have to go to college, you know, this many more years to become a pastor it was hard as in hard in i'd already spent four years in the navy already had been out a couple years i just i wanted to get on with whatever god wanted me to do and i i was impatient at first so the time factor is what kills most of us uh he went on to say tell me how much time you spend alone with god and i will tell you how spiritual you are wow Not how many meetings you go to, not how many gifts you have, not how many sermons you preach, not how many records you've made. Tell me what time you spend alone with God, and I'll tell you how spiritual you really are. And that was uh, Leonard Ravenhill. I thought, wow, that was so good. I just, and I'll be honest with you, I don't spend the time with God that I need to spend. You know, I, I I think if any of us, if we, if we go through the day and we're not convicted, something's wrong. We all have different things going in our life that might not be anything to you, but something to me and vice versa. So we have to be careful not to judge one another, not to try to try to stick our nose up in the air like we're better than somebody else, but instead try to, to see people through the eyes of Christ and realize that Christ sees our heart. So this is some of the things I, I, I thought about. In the, in the past two services. Are your deepest desires focused on what you can get out of this world while you're here? I told you a story about my brother asking my mom, well, mom, what are you going to do with all the stuff that you've accumulated? She goes, well, I'm going to take it with me. And he goes, Dad, mom, you can't take it with you. You know, they don't have a, a trailer hitch on the back of a hearse. You know, there's a lot to that. So something else, when you begin walking in the will of the Father, life gets exciting. And I know some of you, you know, you say, well, I'm kind of tired of the excitement. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, or not excitement, it, it seems more like trials and tribulations. I'd like to have some joy. Well, with walking with the Lord comes joy, excitement, grief, and fear. Um, more than anything, a lifetime of surrender. I heard Joyce Myers once say, uh, how many, so many people say, oh, I want a ministry just like yours. And one time she said, no, you don't, because you're not willing to suffer and surrender and go through with the things that I have already gone through. And as I was preparing for this message, and right before I went on, you, you, when you see a video of yourself, you see yourself in the camera, you see all the little scars, and you see all the little marks on your body. And when you see pictures of your old, old friends, I have old friends in high school that they watch our services every once in a while, and they just got together, oh, a couple of them got together about three weeks ago, and they took a selfie, and I looked at that, I said, oh my, have I aged that much? And I'm sure I have. And I looked at their faces, and the scars that are on their faces 
are you could call them badges of courage you know the i don't know if you ever read the be- the book called the red badge of courage about a civil war um hero and the red badge of courage was actually a wound when you were wounded and you know i think of the scars that all of us have inside and out and how they all tell a story but if those scars don't lead to the glory of the Lord and obedience and surrender to Him, the scars really don't say much. Now, there's a new song out. I have to do some more research on what it is. But it, it talks about um, the devil's trying to make scars on me. But devil, if you want to see some scars, just look at my Savior's scars. And it talks about the victory we have in Jesus because of His scars. Well, the key verse through this whole, will you ever see the desires of your heart, is from Psalm 34, I'm sorry, Psalm 37, verse 4. And I read it from the New King James, from the Amplified, and the Passion. So tonight I'm just going to read it from the Passion. Psalm 37, 4, find your delight and true pleasure in Yahweh, and he will give you what, you're de- what you desire the most. Some other thoughts. Don't forget... Your heart's desires equal everything you secretly dream about, visualize, or imagine. And that could be good, bad, and ugly, too. So, some things you know, and God knows our heart, and thank God for mercy and grace. Whatever the desires of your heart, it's never too late to receive those godly desires. Probably the most important part of the whole message that I've been talking about the last few weeks Before we ever begin pursuing our heart's desire, we must know that they line up, our heart's desires, line up with God's word and his will. And, excuse me, I went on to say, the more time you spend with God seeking him and obeying his word, the more certain you will be that your heart's desire matches his will. And in fact, when you follow him, he puts those desires in your heart. Again, Psalm 37, 4. Read that carefully. I believe the closer we get to the Lord, the more His desires become our desires. They become in sync with His will. Our desires become in sync with His will. When you're convinced you are in line with God's will and His word, follow the steps that I'll be sharing and receive the desires of your heart. And towards the end of this message, I've already looked ahead, of course, I've already studied ahead, and probably in the next two or th- one or two sessions after this, it it'll, it'll talk about how important that is. But I, I'm not going to jump ahead. Anyway, I already shared with you in the last few sessions. The first step to receive the desires of your heart is to catch a vision of those desires, and of course, are they God's desires? If you're given, if you've given over to the Lord and you listen, He'll begin to develop a vision in your heart of whatever that calling is. And it might not be a huge calling right away. I told you before, God always did things in small pieces with me. I guess because I couldn't handle the big picture, he always gave me the little picture. So another thing is, if you can see it, if you can envision it, you can have it. People say, what? Well, but it means if you can catch a vision in your spirit, the inward man, and believe you will receive what you pray for, it'll be yours. But see, that's that's the challenge. You know, many of you have heard the story I've talked about before where um, we would had our oldest son, Joshua, 36 years ago. And for 15 years, you know, the doctors told us we'd never have any more kids. I've told you that story before. And when I finally got a, I grabbed a hold of what I believe, believed was God's desire. And I knew that I knew, and I was convinced that his desire was that and our desire was the same, that we'd have more kids. That's when the Lord began to, he gave us three more children. Unfortunately, the, the first one after that was a miscarriage. But the other two boys are working hard. They're going to college. They're, they're uh, upstanding young men in the Lord. And um, they're not perfect. But they're, they're doing their best to glorify God in, in the way that they feel God's calling. So I saw that God gave me a vision of these children, and I knew that I knew that I knew. I caught the vision, and I received it. I began to speak it. 
See, there are two kinds of people, those who can see their desires coming to pass ahead of time and those who can't or won't. As when we built our church over there, we all, we, our small group of people, we were in agreement. And it was so great to see everybody come together. Oh my, it was beautiful. See, only one group will be in the victor circle, and that's the group that believes in the desires that God has given you. And don't, so don't let the naysayers talk you out of what belongs to you in the Lord. Now, the second step or the second way you need to, to draw closer to God so that you'll begin to see the desires of your heart, it's to disconnect from the world. And don't, don't jump ahead and say, oh, Pastor Rob says I need to completely seclude myself. No. I've seen churches that do that. They they won't even have anything to do with another pastor, another church. They won't have anything to do with anybody but their little group. I don't mean that. But in, in uh, James 4, 4, it says, a, a paraphrased version, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And in the Amplified Bible, it says, you adulterous, disloyal sinners flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend, that is, loving the things of this world, how, do you, how, how are you a friend? You love the things of this world, is being God's enemy. So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And what he's really saying is when you allow the stuff of this world to be um, more to you than God himself, you're really becoming an enemy to God because he's not your God. The God of this world is your God. But it doesn't mean to throw away the, the things you live with in this world either. There's a balance there. He's talking about allowing stuff to become idols in your life. So, let's say you, you've disconnected from the worldly stuff and you're catching the vision. So, you've decided, you know what? I, you know, I like, a, I like a nice car, I like a nice place to live, I like good food, but that's not everything of, of who I am. And you're catching the vision of what you th feel God is bringing into your life. Well, the important thing is, it's time to prepare your heart to receive those things that God has for you. And uh, that's right, <laughs> that's right just as you prepare the ground for planting any kind of plants. You need to prepare your heart for receiving the blessings from the Lord. And people say, what do you mean? Just just receive it. No, you, you need to believe in the Lord. You need to believe in God the Father and what he can do. You need to see, read, understand, hear about the miracle signs and wonders of God. Truly believe that they're still for today. See, the Bible begins with the key verse I mentioned earlier. Remember Psalm 37, 3 through 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay, But the first part of that, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. So he's not saying, you know, hide in the land. It says dwell and be part of it. Feed on whose faithfulness? His. Delight yourself on him, not the things of this world. See, many believers wonder why good things never seem to happen to them. And I, I try to share with them. Now, don't get me wrong. When you're doing the Lord's work, the devil will do his best to have every bad thing happen to you. I know a lot of you out there can say amen. One of my favorite scriptures that actually was prayed over me many, many years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago. And I just, I love it. It's uh, Proverbs 3, 1 to 4. And in the Passion, it's really, really good. But I like it in, in any of the versions. But in the Passion, Proverbs 3, 1 to 4. Because I, I want, let me, let me backtrack one, one, uh, one moment. The, the reason believers wonder why things, good things don't always happen for them, it's lack of favor with God and man because of their disobedience to his word. It's disobedience to God through the Holy Spirit, through his revelation, as he's speaking, and that's that's why a lot of times good things don't happen to you. You know, I, I was just talking to somebody the other day, and you know, you you come to our church, we teach you that God will give you favor with God and favor with man. And I was sharing how I knew somebody who needed a, a flat screen um, 
smart TV, and they were going to go out and spend a hundred bucks or so. And and I said, well, okay, you know. And I just said, oh, this is interesting. And I have I never go to yard sales. I ended up going to a yard sale. Lo and behold, guess what? There was a nice thirty-two inch flat screen TV. And it was a smart TV. And I asked the lady, and for twenty bucks, I got a smart screen TV with a DVD player in it. And I gave it to the person that was looking for it, and they could not believe how great it works. Well, I believe that's favor with God and favor with man. I uh, then and I was telling that story to somebody else, and they, in fact, are probably watching right now. Uh, the same kind of thing happened to them, where they went into um, like a, a flea market kind of thing, and they saw a flat screen TV with no cord on it, and the people didn't know if it worked, so they said, "I'll tell you what we'll do." Um, if you can find a cord and it turns on, you can have it for free. It did. They got it home. It worked great, and they still use it. So you see, you can have favor with God and favor with man, but you have to begin being obedient to what God wants you to do. So Proverbs 3, 1 to 4 says, My child, if you truly want a long and satisfying life, never forget the things that I have taught you. Follow closely every truth that I have given you. Did you see that? Follow closely the teachings of the Lord, and of course in the Old Testament too. Then you will have a full and rewarding life. You get that full. That's exciting life. Good, bad, and ugly. It'll be exciting. Hold on to the loyal love and don't let go. And be faithful to all that you've been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity. Wow. With truth written upon your heart. That's how you'll find favor and understanding with both God and men. You will gain the reputation of the living life well. Now, isn't that powerful? Remember, that's Proverbs 3, 1 to 4. And verse 4 is the one that says, You will have favor with God and favor with men. See, we always expect God to do his part, don't we? Oh, God, you know, this is, this is your job. you got to do your part. Yet, we are not willing to do our part. And uh, don't shout me when I'm preaching good, as old uh, Jesse Duplantis would say, because that's true. Often we want this and we want that, but we never do anything for the Lord. We don't do what he tells us to do. Jerry Seville explains it in this way. He says, you have to get to a place where you qualify to receive the good things God wants to give you. And I know, because we're born again, the blood of Jesus... We're joint heirs with Jesus, you know, we have certain uh, benefits. I'm not saying we don't, but listen to what he says. This is so important. He said, when you seek him, you trust him, and you delight yourself in him, then it becomes his responsibility to bring you uh, the good things that will satisfy the desires of your heart. But see, if you don't believe and trust him, why would... Why would he delight in, in blessing you all the time? Yeah, you'll get blessed every once in a while. But why, you know, when you don't even trust, it's almost, I think, um, I think it was Jesus in the gospel said, you know, don't be a double-minded person don't, or a two-faced person. Over here, say one thing, say I believe, and to the next person, say I don't. And so often our words actually do that. If you start to pursue the, pursue the things you want in life, Rather than pursuing God, you will disqualify yourself from those promises. See, that's one way you won't get and you won't be able to receive what God has because you're pursuing the stuff of this world. So seek God's face. Don't seek his hands. When, so when I first got saved, one of my favorite songs I started listening to as a, in Christian music was from Keith Green. Many of you have heard this song. It's called, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. And, and Keith Green, actually, he was extremely popular right during the time and just after I got saved. And then, of course, he was killed in the airplane wreck. Uh, but, but I didn't get to know of him until probably, probably two years after he was killed. In that song, he says, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful, Your Face is All I Seek. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds in me. O Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. I want to take your word and shine it all around. But first help me to just live it, Lord. And when I'm doing well, help me to never seek a crown. 
for my reward is giving glory to you. O oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. That's just part of it. So, and when he says, seek the face and not the hand, because usually it's, oh, what are you going to give me now when we think hand out? Instead, you seek his face. He will bless you. So we're still talking about disconnecting from the world. Remember, step number two. When you pursue, pursue intimacy with God, you will qualify yourself to receive all that he has promised. Remember what Jerry Seville said. And the best part is you will lack you will not lack any good thing, the Bible says. You will not lack any good thing. In the Amplified Bible, in Psalm 34.10, says the young lions lack food and grow hungry, but they who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Now, I thought it was interesting. He said the young lions lack food and grow hungry. It's interesting. The more mature lions are the ones that actually do the hunting, and they're the ones that are constantly well-fed. And when something's killed, they're the first to feed on it because of that. And it says, but they who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Well, the more mature you are in the Lord, the more you seek him, you'll lack no good, um, no good thing. Make a commitment to connect with God every day. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself to him. If that means setting, if you don't have time every, every morning to sit down and have devotion, Sit and listen to some music and, and take some moments to talk to him. If you can, spend as much time in the Word as you can, even if it's just listening to a, a CD or or um, BibleGateway.com has one. You can actually listen to it. You just go into it and you can actually listen to per, um, a whole book and there's a guy that reads it. So trust in his love for you and he will bring you all the desires of your heart and he'll bring them to pass. See, A.W. Tozer said, um, God wants us to know that when we have him, we have everything. That means when we totally, truly believe in him, we have everything. So the first one was catch a vision. The second one is separate yourself from the worldly things. The third is throw off unforgiveness. And it comes from Hebrews 12, 1, uh, throw off everything that hinders you. In the Amplified Bible, it says, let's see, Amplified, it says in verse uh, 1 of Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and sin which is so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. So run with endurance and active persistence. Active persistence. The passion. It says, as for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. Have we done that? Remember, we're talking about forgiveness. And the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon's race. With passion and determination. For the path has been already marked out before us. Wow. Isn't that powerful? So you've got. You caught a vision. And disconnected from the world. And maybe you've already done much more than that. Maybe you, you've done all that you can do. And when you're standing in faith to receive the desires of your heart, you're likely contemplate the following scripture. In Ephesians 6.13, it says, Having done all, stand. Remember? Ephesians 6.13. But a lot of times, people who have done all they want to do, not all they are required to do. See, people say, well, this is what I want to do. And this is what uh, Tim and I challenge everybody all the time. Is in your prayer life, ask God to remind you uh, maybe some unforgiveness in your life. Ask God to show you uh, where you need to change. So one of the most common areas where people miss it, where they don't do everything that God tells them to do, is in the area of that unforgiveness. I heard one person say, it's the big dog of hindrances to receiving your heart's desire. The big dog of hindrances to receiving your heart's desire. Part of the reason for this misconception of what forgiveness really means 
See, there's a there's a, a big misconception of what forgiveness means. <clears throat> Excuse me. Forgiving someone isn't a special favor to them. It isn't just it isn't justifying what they've done, and it doesn't even indicate a restored relationship. In fact, forgiveness isn't something that happens between you and another person. It's something that happens within you. Now think about that, because a lot of times you'll ask somebody for forgiveness, and they'll tell you where to go. But what's important is that in you, you have forgiven them. It, it's, it's a quiet, it's a quite personal transformation in your own heart more important than anything else forgiving someone else sets you free that's why paul exhorts believers to focus on this one thing and I never looked at it this way until i read this statement do not focus or focus on this one thing paul said forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead so forgetting those who have wronged you so what whatever has been said about you done to you stolen from you make a decision to forgive no matter how big or how small obey god throw off unforgiveness look forward to what lies ahead and watch as the path to your heart's desire opens right up to you and you'll begin to see god bringing in those heart's desires so I, i'm excited for the next let's see uh the next time i will be here will be friday night and we'll have a chance to continue with this lesson i hope you're getting something from it sometimes it just takes somebody telling you again catch the vision that god has given you because you get to know him through his word through his revelation and through prayer and separate yourself from the stuff of this world the loving of the stuff of this world and and make sure you have forgiven everybody that God is well that you've forgiven everybody that has wronged you. Forget the past and go on. So I can't wait to talk about next Friday, but I'm gonna hold off. So part four, I'll be here next Friday. God bless, take care, and I believe God is gonna change some hearts. God bless and get ready. See ya.